Hey everyone, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar here today. Um, can you click on the screen so that way my clicker works? All right, so uh, your host for today, I'm Steve Kroll. I'm our president here at Granular. I'm Anna Borchardt. I'm our director of digital media and oversee our programmatic advertising. And I'm Megan Guzzi, a senior manager here who supports Anna and the rest of the team with programmatic. And Grant, just real quick, our, we're recording as well. Okay, perfect. So um, just an agenda here of what we're going to cover. We're going to try and uh, make sure that we uh, cover everything. We don't rush through stuff too much and leave some time for Q&A on the off chance that we do not get to a question or you ask, uh, ask a question and um, we just don't have a chance to answer it. We will make sure to follow up with uh, you individually. So what we're going to cover is we're going to talk about why Grant was talking about programmatic. Um, we're going to dive in in a pretty granular way into the different targeting, um, the different channels, the different targeting options. Uh, we've got some examples of use cases and then Q&A. Um, you should see a little bar as we've illustrated in this graphic here. If you want to ask questions, feel free to submit those. Um, we've got our colleague Grant Nelson off screen who's producing this and who, along with our colleague Jamie, uh, will help troubleshoot anything. Definitely shoot her any uh, questions if you have those. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. So why programmatic? So Granular next year will be 10 years in business. Our founder uh, and CEO Jordan Meyer started this in December 2014. Uh, and when it, he came up with the, the name Granular because he kept hearing it so much in meetings and people talked about that they want to get more granular with their targeting and more granular insights. And this is a screenshot of our homepage. And, you know, we even have that defined here in terms of what it is, which is, um, you know, the reason why he, he thought it was such a great idea for a company name is because, you know, to target something in a granular way means it's highly detailed, there's deep level of understanding, and um, it's data driven. So what led uh, what led us to programmatic? So um, when when Granular was started, it was really initially focused on uh, search, shopping, uh, retargeting on paid social before Meta really had matured their uh, ads product. Um, but we've since evolved and grown to manage ads on 20 plus different platforms. And programmatic was really something that we initially... Uh, started to get into uh, for two reasons. So the first is um, we had clients who would ask about specific uh, requests. Can you geofence around competitors? We're going to be presenting at a conference. Can you geofence? Uh, they wanted to do specific buys on websites or uh, you know run uh, connected TV ads, or they wanted to do ABM uh, marketing. But um, you know. For us, that was really, you know, again, we're talking, you know, seven, eight years ago, the way that um, we initially, you know, got exposed to it, that it was talked about, uh, even though our team had experience working with it in the past. Um, but what really led to us diving deeper into it is, uh, as you know, a lot of you are clients on this and other people who are uh, mature uh, marketers understand, you know, it used to be that on platforms like Facebook, uh, you could target people who followed certain pages, you could get really granular targeting in terms of uh, interests and behaviors, demographic information. And um, it seemed like every year um, that targeting, you know, kept getting removed. So that way it was broader and broader audience. And you still could do uh, some of that more detailed uh, targeting uh, from layering on audiences on Google's network, but we've even seen them uh, make changes to continually remove uh, that targeting. And so it really pushed us into exploring, you know, how can we make sure that our ads are as uh, granular targeted as possible, uh, full, full funnel. So why we've really gone from just being uh, an agency that has uh, dabbled in it to really having it be a real uh, tentpole uh, of our agency, something we see that works really, really well for our clients is uh, number one, we've seen when programmatic uh, is implemented alongside our uh, campaigns we're running uh, that are mid to low funnel on Google, 
on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on TikTok, that you know we're seeing better brain recall, better uh, ROI, higher conversion rates, more people are searching uh, uh, for our client's brand. So we're just seeing better outcomes. So that's improved return on ad spend, decreased cost per lead. Um, second, you know, I talked about some of those uh, targeting options being taken away from platforms like uh, Google and Facebook. Um, programmatic, we, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those last uh, uh, areas where you can layer on that really rich uh, first and third party data, and uh, we can uh, we have targeting that's available, um, but also we have some really unique inventory that, again, a lot of these publishers, whether it's uh, website content. Um, or video content, that there's still uh, a bit of a, a walled garden with that content where you're really only able to access it through programmatic or through these really big brokered buys. Well, for a lot of uh, companies, even big companies, you don't want to commit to doing uh, huge buys. Being able to get at it through programmatic is really the only way to uh, get at that inventory and get at that audience. And you know what we've seen is it's really empowered our clients uh, and Anna and Megan and anyone on our team who works on these campaigns to really have uh, that full flexibility and customization, um, being able to target full funnel, multi-channel coverage. Again, this is in concert with you know our Google campaigns, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok. We're obviously still huge fans, huge believers, and it's important that you're running there. But being able to layer in programmatic has really been a game changer for uh, results for our clients. And so um, just wanted to put this slide together quick um, just to talk about some of the common misconceptions. Um, so, you know, one of the misconceptions is lack of control. You know, I'll say this, um, you know, me personally, when you know, I've been working in this uh, industry almost 20 years, and there was a, a perception in the past that, you know, when you would do programmatic, you're just doing a kind of a buy flighting ads and you would get back a report saying, here's the impressions, here's the sites that you you ran on. And so that could not be further from the truth in terms of, you know, in, in a lot of ways, programmatic gives you uh, just as good of control, if not better control than a lot of the other platforms, because uh, you have the ability to target you know, with the audiences, all the inventory that's available, which we're going to get into some of those examples, um, all the parameters on and on, Anna and Megan are going to touch on that. So crazy amount of control. Um, and the fact that, you know, again, people really have looked at it as a, a channel that's strictly brand awareness. Look, it's a great channel for that. It's a great mechanism for that. But um, we've seen that it's, you know, granular, our bread and butter, our helping drive direct response results for our clients. That's why we're such big believers in uh, Google and the, the other paid social platforms. But uh, we've really been surprised at how effective it's been in terms of um, being able to assist with moving people down the funnel and uh, improving those direct response uh, campaigns that we're running. And so the, the key is um, having some strategy and deliberateness behind uh, programmatic, you know, not there are times where you do just, you know, want to execute a, a buy and that's something that, you know, the client wants to do that you as the advertiser wants to do or something we talk about. But, you know, the reality is, you know, if, you know, like everything we do at Granular, having stated goals, uh, KPIs that you measure um, uh, and the audience that you want to reach, we can really do a lot with programmatic. That's pretty neat. So, um, I think that's the last slide I had for me, and then Anna is going to go ahead and take over from here. Yeah, so as Steve mentioned, there's a lot to programmatic that is not available on other channels anymore. So the biggest part is going to be the targeting. So whether you call that pinpoint or granular, you can get very specific about who you want to target using third-party data and then also contextual targeting. So a lot of publishers, which again, we'll get into in a little bit, have very specific segments that allow us to target the most niche user that your audience might be. There's also a lot of um, different dynamic options that we can have. So it uses real-time bidding where we are focused on the audience and also the placement to making sure that the ad is getting into the most impactful space possible for you. And then lastly, we continue to analyze campaign performance, making a dashboard where clients can see all of the data, but then we're on the back end making changes to different audiences, whether that is 
you know, one segment of people who have visited a competitor store, there might be different publishers out there. So we're constantly reviewing those and making sure that we're getting the best audience to reach your KPIs. So to kind of go through all of that and talk about how granular or detailed you can get with programmatic, we're going to go through the different targeting types and also channels. So starting off with channels, we have kind of the bread and butter ones of programmatic that you might be a little bit more known to whether that is your experience in digital advertising or seeing ads directly this way. So one of the main channels is display. So we all know that Google display network exists and has display banners and roughly the same sizes or the same sizes, but the difference with programmatic is getting those third party party publishers and additional segments. So we can use that contextual targeting, which allows us to match different keywords to website content or using those third party audiences to make sure that we're showing ads from a awareness or consideration perspective to your key user. Native is another channel that is very similar to display. We'll typically see the same kind of placements, whether that's, you know, ESPN, CNN, et cetera, except it is a more dynamic ad. So it'll look more like an in-feed article, which has an additional headline and body text for you to have a little bit more information about your brand. On mobile, there's very small display banners. So we'll usually see a higher click-through rate from native just because we have that additional brand context. We're in a display ad. You can't always have that much text included. CTV, this is personally one of my favorite programmatic channels um, just because there's so much that we can do with CTV. So whether that is overlaying audiences to again, further get to your key demographic or hitting the big publishers such as Hulu, Sling TV, Direct TV, HBO Max, Discovery Plus, Netflix obviously has come out with ads recently too. So this is a way that even the smallest clients or smallest budgets are able to access really great inventory that people are a little bit more receptive of as we know. So again, engaging with your customers when they're not actively on the internet, not actively searching for your product or on social media to hit people when they're watching Disney or Hulu. So some examples, as I just kind of said, um, so we can also access show level reporting to see exactly what TV show your ads are being shown on. When you are having a traditional buy through a local um, station, you might not see all of that detail. So again, the benefit of CTV programmatic advertising is that we can see how many total impressions are seen for the ad, how many unique impressions are seen for the ad, and how far the user has watched the video too. So through a video completion rate or how far through the commercial or ad they made it through on Fire TV or on Disney, for example. Um, so digital audio, this is one of our, you know, kind of newer placements, if you want to call it that. A lot of people are starting to expand into digital audio. So you can reach placements on Spotify, Pandora, individual radio stations, et cetera. But again, the benefit with programmatic audio, instead of going more direct, is that you can, again, add in that target audience to make sure you are targeting your individual user rather than going a little bit more broad on other channels where, as Steve had mentioned, are getting rid of a lot of detailed targeting. So you can just make sure that we're hitting those very specific user bases. Podcasts are targeting um, will also kind of go in line with that digital audio. Um, for these, it is going to be dynamically placed pre-recorded audio that serves across various podcast inventory on multiple publishers. So again, you can access all of that third-party targeting to overlay, making sure that you're just really hitting your users who are listening to NPR or various podcasts throughout their day. Um, so those are the, you know, if we want to call them more traditional um, programmatic channels, programmatic can encompass a lot of different meanings. Another one of that will be digital out of home, or if you might hear us shorten it to D-O-O-H or O-O-H. So within digital out of home, there's kind of two to three different components. There are indoor screens, and then there are also outdoor screens. So looking at the indoor screens, those are going to be pretty much any screen that's not what we're thinking of as one of the ones that I had previously shared. So you can reach people as they're going about their day, whether that's eating at a restaurant, they're waiting at their gate, 
at Mitchell International Airport, for example, they're in an Uber and there's a screen on the back. If they're getting gas at Speedway, whether that's inside or outside, red box machines outside of Walgreens, movie theaters, office buildings, apartments, and even more. So you get really precise ge geographic and then placement inventory. So this is really great to show users who are not aware of your brand while they're going about their day. Unfortunately, we just don't have as much additional context for dynamically showing ads to specific users based on how these ads are displayed. So for kind of the outdoor um, portion of digital out of home, we've got digital billboards. So this is part one of part two for digital out of home on the outside. So digital billboards, obviously a huge benefit of this is that you're able to have constant ad testing without needing to print individual vinyl billboards. Vinyl billboards are expensive. You only get one for however long you set up your um, IO for. So with using digital out of home billboards, you're able to access inventory across multiple publishers. So in Milwaukee, for example, you can set up one campaign that allows you to reach Clear Channel and Lamar. Both of those are the big guys in downtown Milwaukee. So you have more opportunity to have placements and reach more users in a specific area rather than just having one billboard in one area for a certain time period. So again, with this, you're able to test out different ads as well. So if you have a weekend sale, you can have that running for just a handful of days and then go back to your typical ad. You're also able to set up ad scheduling. So if you only want to hit the rush hour traffic and not worry about the people who are possibly driving through downtown Milwaukee at 11 p.m., you can set up that very specific um, ad scheduling as well. And then lastly, for the outdoor screens, any screen that's not a digital billboard, I'll say, um, would be considered this. So it'll be those gas station screens outside, um, taxi or Uber toppers, for example, and then even public transportation, such as the hop in Milwaukee, Burns Commons has a screen that we're able to place ads on. Cool. So now that we've gone over some of the placements where we can put ads, let's talk more about the way we can target users. So there are lots of different options within programmatic to target users, but we're going to focus on a few that typically bring good results for our clients and that we usually recommend. So we'll start with third-party targeting. So other channels, like we've mentioned previously, have gotten rid of a lot of their interest targeting, like Facebook. Um, here you can see that they've removed the cinema interest. So these are things that are still going to be available on programmatic because of the third-party publishers that allow us to reach those really specific users. Um, so we can, for example, target people who have visited a competitor store or website or have bought a particular brand because we get that data from programmatic directly from, for example, Amex or MasterCard um, or Nielsen sharing that information with us. So those publishers gather their own data and we can use that for targeting. And then segments can also be customized by intersecting two audiences to make a more niche user. So for example, someone who has visited a Target and also owns a dog, that can be combined into one niche user for targeting on programmatic. Um, contextual targeting is another great option. So this is good for when an audience is a little too niche or if it's a sensitive category. Um, contextual targeting lets us give programmatic campaigns certain keywords or phrases, and then it will find those phrases within the context of a website, and we'll be able to target specific web pages with those contexts. And this works really well for native ads, which give you some more room for more headline and body copy to make the ad a little larger, and then native really blends into the um, content that the user is already consuming on that page, so it's a really natural ad format. Another great option, especially for B2B, is ABM, account-based marketing. So again, programmatic is not just for B2C or for retail like you might think it is, but there are some great B2B options as well. Um, typically, a lot of people will go to LinkedIn for this type of targeting, but we can actually get even more niche audiences and sometimes even larger, more engaged audiences um, with programmatic for B2B. So third-party audiences are available through publishers like Dun & Bradstreet. Um, we can also target companies by their EIN. 
And that allows us to just get really targeted. You can run brand awareness campaigns this way or lead gen. Um, these campaigns are good for display or native where LinkedIn just might not have a large enough audience or maybe really expensive. And the little chart on the side is a really good visual, I think, to show how you can combine these segments. So you could target um, someone who has a particular job function at a company that has a certain size, um, a certain number of employees. So it's a really cool way to overlap those segments. And then finally, the most um, probably common thing that you're all familiar with, first party lookalike and dynamic retargeting kind of grouped together here. So obviously first party data is any users lists that you may own as a company, like your current customers. So we can use that for targeting. We can also use those lists to create lookalike audiences, which help expand more in the upper funnel and are good for awareness tactics. And then again, dynamic retargeting, we're usually familiar with that. If you visit a website and you view a pair of shoes and those shoes follow you around the internet for a while. Um, so we can do that through programmatic with um, like commercial retail items, but we can also do B2B dynamic retargeting, which is kind of interesting um, using the content the user viewed on your website to show an ad specific to that content. So now that we've kind of gone over the targeting and the placements, we wanna talk about a few examples and some success stories we've seen with programmatic. So we'll start with a museum and retail store that's local here. Um, the museum was looking for a way to increase brand awareness outside of normal Facebook and Google audiences. Um, those can get exhausted pretty quickly and we had been running ads for a pretty long time. So programmatic was the next place to look to expand. The goal is to increase foot traffic to the brick and mortar museum and to their retail store using display ads. So the strategy that we recommended was a combination of a few different targeting um, options. So we used third party audiences. So we targeted people who were planning a trip to Milwaukee or looking for things to do in Milwaukee. We also were able to do geo framing. So um, take tagging the museum campus and then targeting people who had been there say within the past year, but not within the last 90 days to come back and see new exhibits. And then also the, the one that I think is really cool is geofencing local events. So we're able to, for example, target Summerfest, um, an area around that, and then specifically show ads on parking apps for people who are trying to park or pay for parking going to Summerfest and get those people aware of the museum that's nearby and gain more foot traffic that way. So the impact this had, um, we got a lot of impressions reaching users who were not already familiar with the museum. And we're also able to do foot traffic reporting to see exactly how many people based on their like mobile phones had seen the ads and then showed up on the museum campus, which is really cool. So another industry that we've worked with in the past has been um, consumer retail and then e-commerce. So a lot of these are reaching users who are not necessarily aware of the brand or have been aware of the brand and might not have made a purchase or have made purchases at a competitor where the prices are definitely a lot better at the current brand. So we use a full stone full funnel strategy for this was our recommendation. So hitting display, video, CTV, and then dynamic retargeting, really focusing in on that third-party data where we can get to specific brands that people are purchasing, which would tie back to the ads that we created. And then targeting also people who have been to competitor stores or have an interest in competitor stores, or again, that user behavior that they've been to a competitor store in the last 60 days. Additionally, we were able to create, as Megan had referenced, some of those very custom third-party segments. So targeting people who have children and have been to a competitor store like Target in the last 60 days. So from this, we were able to see really great increased brand awareness and then that local foot traffic to locations after a handful of weeks of advertising. And then also just influencing consideration to other channels, such as Google Shopping and Facebook, um, with the um, pixels that we use, we're able to set up order ID values to pass back so that we can look into Google Analytics and see where the user made their final purchase instead of just the programmatic tag, for example. Um, so another example in higher education. Um, the goal was to reach new users who were in market for college education, um, both for undergrad and non-traditional experiences like online education. 
Um, brand awareness was a little bit lower due to other channels being more focused on lower funnel tactics like um, Facebook lead ads, which we were running, and then Google search as well. So our strategy here was to use some cross-channel advertising across display, native video, and digital out of home to really reach top of funnel users since higher education has a pretty broad audience that a lot of people can be um in. So we use digital out of home channels, including billboards um, in the Milwaukee area and at the Mitchell International Airport, using display native and video focusing on parents of high school students and direct placements for college and university review sites, where people might be looking for more information on which college to choose. So the impact of that was that we increased form completions from new users directly through the ads landing page. So this was more um, even beyond awareness and generating actual leads. And then we saw a much higher frequency for users who hadn't previously heard of the university as well. So also in the B2C space, um, we had a cinema who obviously the pandemic led to a decrease in user attendance in theaters. So there was less search behavior occasionally for this on Google search or even on Facebook. So the goal is to increase foot traffic to theaters using CTV advertising. So as we had mentioned in the channel and targeting section with CTV, it's not just a target Hulu and anyone who's there. We're able to reach more specific users who have previously been to the brand. And then also those who have interests in particular movie genres or even more specific um, types like Marvel movies or have even been to a competitor theater in the area. So on CTV, we're able to overlay those audiences and then target those premium placements such as Hulu and HBO Max inventory to just make sure that our ads are being shown when users are watching that premium content. So again, using foot traffic reporting, we were able to see exactly how many users ended up visiting the theater. So when they first saw an impression, how many impressions it took before they visited a location. And then with multiple theaters, we're also able to see which location has the highest average impressions for each. And then moving into the B2B space, as we said, LinkedIn works really well for B2B, but when there is a little bit more of a niche audience for B2B, whether that's a specific industry or just job title, as LinkedIn uses a lot of user inputted data, um, the B2B targeting on programmatic is awesome. So whether that's to increase potential like realtors for this, an example, or decision makers in a relevant industry, we're able to create custom segments using Dun & Bradstreet data for those decision makers in the healthcare, dental, and you know pharmaceutical industries to match to that client. So overlaying those on display, native, and video, we're able to increase awareness of a client brand. So targeting B2B audiences on display and native can lead to a really strong click-through rate, but also those who are targeted on CTV, we're able to start that user somewhere and then create a retargeting list for users who watch that CTV ad. So even if we haven't hit that particular user segment on display or native, we're still able to show them a display ad after they viewed the CTV ad, which can then of course help increase potential conversion rates. All right. We uh, we are gonna, I think, turn off the screen here. Are we on video now, Grant? All right. Um, we can't see ourselves on video, so I have to assume we look good. Uh, so um, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, definitely feel free in the um, in the bottom of the screen here, the bottom of your window, to submit those, and then Grant can go ahead and read those out to us. We'll give this, you know about 30 seconds and then otherwise we can just talk through any um we have some pre-prepared questions in the event that we answered everyone's questions and you know we are just looking for additional insights all right so one of the you know questions um that will come up is you know, when people want to run programmatic, um, they'll come to, you know, our clients come to us no different than if they want to run on paid social or YouTube, but they don't have video assets or they don't have uh, image assets, what what should they do? So um, typically what we do is we do ask our clients to um, lean as much as possible on their internal resources that they have, um, just because we, you know, that's going to be on brand. There's already a um, a system for being able to 
develop those assets. Um, in the event that you still need help from an outside partner, we do have uh, other agency partners, great agency partners uh, here in the Milwaukee uh, area who would do a fantastic job on creative uh, or uh, on the video side. Um, and then as a, as a last resort, if it you know, really comes down to you really uh, are looking for some help, uh, we do have some limited capabilities. We really prefer to um, kind of work as a, a project a project manager, uh, you know, to kind of help uh, say, you know, what we're looking for in terms of the assets. So, um, yeah, that's um, that's how we handle that. All right. So looks like there's a, a question here. Um, I missed the first few minutes of the training. Will this be recorded and emailed out? Yes, it will. That's a good question. This is being recorded, so you'll have access to this, and it'll actually be posted on the Granular website. Um, Grant and Jamie from our team do an amazing job, so they'll um, actually package this up, and there'll be an email that goes out to anyone who attended with a link to that, um, and then any questions that um, uh, you have, you can definitely um, reach out to us. So a good question. So next, uh, Granular granular is strictly a media placement house. Um, so I can answer that question. I think I understand it. So um, granular, yeah, we don't, we've, from the beginning, we've been a, uh, a digital marketing agency focused on the uh, managing uh, digital advertising, pay-per-click advertising. And um, that's really extended to anything that's digital, uh, digital media. You know, we, anything that's around a measurement um, we will get involved with. So uh, we did a webinar about Google Analytics 4. We'll set up things Google Tag Manager. We've got a pretty robust reporting uh, department here. But um, yeah, we don't do websites. We don't um, do SEO here at Granular. We've got a sister agency called Momentic that does that. Uh, so we do not do uh, any, any experiential, anything outside of uh, digital marketing. Another question here, maybe Anna and uh, Megan, do you have a recommended starting budget or percentage of budget for brands looking to get into programmatic? Yeah, so I could take this one. So for this, it's a little hard to say just because it's really going to depend on what you're looking for. So I think kind of the second question um, can tie into this. So it says, do you recommend starting with specific placements or media types for someone just getting started with program programmatic? So my answer is going to be, you know, what are you trying to get out of it? Do you have video assets? Because if not, obviously, then we might not want to start with CTV. CTV is also going to be more expensive. So that's where you're going to need a little bit higher of a budget, especially when we're looking at more premium placements like Hulu, HBO Plus, Disney Plus, for example, even Netflix getting into ads. So for a starting budget, you know, you can definitely start more on like the display and native side, because again, you can have all of that really great targeting from the third party publishers and usually we'll see a really great impact on your general website traffic with that. For a starting budget or percentage of budget, that really is going to depend on your overall media budget. Um, programmatic does have slightly higher CPMs than other channels, so it's a little hard to say, but usually a couple thousand dollars per month, again, depending on the channel, would be kind of that starting point. How are you prepping clients for the end of the cookie? Will the tactics you recommend change? Um, yeah, we in we're we're happy to follow up on this, but you know, on on our end, um, we uh, we're following the um, the 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 path and the approach that uh, some of the leading platforms are taking, um, like the Trade Desk, uh, for instance. But, you know, we've already had to adapt to this world with iOS 14 and what that did to Meta and with users cross device, cross platform. Uh, it's why we do think it's important to be running on a bunch of different uh, platforms to be able to stitch together that full user experience. You know, we talked a lot about Google Analytics 4 and Google, that's really their response to wanting to train uh, marketers uh, on this kind of reality that it's not this last click experience that users engage with content and visit websites 
for multiple devices over a course of uh, time. So, yeah, I mean, we've been uh, kind of in this world and working with closely with our partners and our platforms to, you know, figure out what makes the most sense because even though a lot of uh, advertisers still do think about things in a last click uh, way, you know, that's something that um, I think we're seeing you have to think about it more broadly than that. I can take the next one. Um, so the question is, when working with you, will your team be proactively monitoring and making strategic recommendations back to get the best results? Um, yes. So when you work with us, you are working directly with me or Megan. Um, so we'll meet monthly, bi-weekly to tell you what's going on in the campaigns, tell you what changes we have. Um, we share a monthly report that goes over all of that. But as I kind of shared in the um, audience section and then also the um, targeting section, we're constantly reviewing the data every week to make sure that the placements you're on are the best if we're going after more of the audience. And then on the audience side, reviewing which publishers are to see if there's any new segments that we can incorporate as well to make sure that we are, again, targeting the user, not just the general placement or total number of impressions that we're reaching. Um, and then there's a second part of this question that says, do you um, include making creative change recommendations? So to our best ability, obviously we are not a creative agency, so we can tell you what's working and what's not working, but when it comes to, you know, any like a creative direction, um, again, we can give some recommendations, but not make any of those actual assets. Yeah, I mean, so maybe this would be a good opportunity, uh, Megan, and then Anna just talk about, you know, for someone who's not done programmatic, and you've got a client you've talked through, and you've got all the targeting available, all the inventory, um, and you're looking to, you know, say, hey, this is, you know, the clients, they've, they've spent a lot of time advocating, hey, we should put some budget towards this, it's something that, you know, we've been advocating for, because it gives us that targeting, we know it help our campaigns, what is the the tool in the tool belt you're going to are kind of what does that you know, plan look like? I know Anna touched on that. Sometimes display native could be a good combo, but how do you approach it? And then how do you communicate, you know, those campaigns, you know, alongside, you know, our traditional, you know, platforms running on like Google and Facebook and LinkedIn? Yeah, my favorite part, um, just learning about programmatic over the past several months is just how granular it can be. So I love to recommend programmatic for my clients like higher ed, where they have a really niche audience. Like for example, I have a campaign that is aviation um, degree. So that's really niche and something that we're not able to really find a good targeting for on Google and Facebook. So that's when programmatic becomes a great option. And it's also cool that we can use the same creative that you were using on Google display for programmatic. So it's not a lot of extra lift for the client. So those are some cool use cases that I like. Um, I'm trying to, um, think through, all right, we're don't have any uh, other questions here. So, you know, I, I guess, um, another, you know, what, what are you uh, seeing Anna in this space that, um, you know, has really been, uh, exciting uh, to you and how programmatic fits, fits in the ecosystem? Are there really interesting use cases or things that you wish, more advertisers, you know, would, you know, get behind? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, something that's changing a lot, especially just from like the CTV standpoint is, you know, before none of the channels or publishers were paid um, ads and now Netflix getting the ads, Disney plus obviously having ads, it really just expands our ability to place ads on places that people are actually watching content or, you know, reading content. So for me, one of the most exciting parts is really just how much is expanding because again, I had Netflix and I was pretty much only watching Netflix. So now that I can target people who are, you know, just watching Netflix, I think is a really great opportunity, especially again, for smaller brands. Previously, you would have to go have a direct buy for, you know, one TV station or one particular area, whereas now you can put bid adjustments to particular publishers and make sure you're getting targeted there, but expanding your entire inventory. I think that's, you know, one of the coolest parts. And then also just the audience targeting, as Megan was saying, when, you know, depending on what the client brand is or what your brand is, you might have a very specific audience that you're trying to target. And maybe there's not a lot of people searching for it, or you have a really great low funnel strategy, but through those third-party targeting options, even when we're making more of those like custom um, contextual targetings as well, we can make sure that we're targeting 
your user. Sweet. Yeah. And I've seen that on um, particular client you work on, which is pretty cool. Um, all right. So one last call out here for questions. Um, if you don't want to ask them here, that's okay. We are going to be following up here um, uh, after the, the webinar with um, an email, which is going to include a, a link to this. And then if you specifically had a question for me or Anna or Megan, just feel free to call it out and reply to uh, Grant and we should be good.